uh, let me also thank the Society for Asian Art for inviting me once again uh, to be a part of the wonderful Arts of Asia lecture series. Thank you to Pat uh, for including me. And also, uh, I'd like to thank Crystal Lee and Jennifer Gao for uh, their organization. So yes, uh, this year's theme, Art on the Move Across Asia and Beyond, is particularly fortuitous, I think, in a year um, where we started a new Center for Silk Road Studies at UC Berkeley, uh, and this was thanks to a very generous gift by the Tang family, two branches of the Tang family, uh, Oscar Tang and Agnes Shu Tang uh, in New York, and also Nadine, uh, Leslie, and Martin Tang of the Bay Area and Hong Kong. Um, and as Peter mentioned, in a moment of shameless self-promotion, uh, I brought copies of our fall semester events calendar and also a sign-up sheet if you're interested in being on the mailing list. Um, I was thinking a little bit about this year's Arts of Asia exploration of, quote, centuries of active exchange of art and ideas across the great trade routes of Asia, Europe, and the New World, which really fits perfectly into much of uh, my own research that I've conducted over the years. Uh, first, mostly focusing on the overland routes, commonly referred to as the Silk Roads. Uh, later, to also include the maritime networks as well. And in particular, I'm very intrigued uh, about the role that diasporic mercantile communities, diasporic in the sense those that lived abroad either temporarily or permanently, uh, and the role that they played in cross-cultural exchanges. They were, um, I think, uh, they functioned a bit as vectors for the transmission of um, cultural ideas. And to some degree, that fits into my own background. As Peter mentioned, um, I am a daughter of an Indian sea captain. Uh, accompanying him uh, many, many times uh, in my early childhood across Asia, but also to the Middle East, uh, Kuwait, the east coast of Africa, Japan, as you can see in these photographs. And I remember very fondly these types of cultural <laughs> exchanges, the meeting uh, of one mercantile community with the local mercantile community, and the kind of friendships and cross-fertilization that occur, uh, friendships that were developed and cross-fertilization that occurred. So in this photograph, you can see myself and my brother together with my father on the ship, and then all the, the get-togethers uh, in situ in all these very wonderful uh, and different cultural uh, environments. Now, what, I, what do I like to do today? Uh, and I'm not sure whether I'll be able to get to uh, everything that I've set out to do today, but I would like to address a couple of questions that I think are important. Uh, one, what do we know about ancient routes? How do we find them? Uh, also, how do, I, how do we identify the carriers of foreign goods and commodities? Um, third, what are the, some of the markers of cultural exchange and can we move beyond just identifying those markers um, to deeply understanding the underlying factors um, of these exchanges? And I think, uh, and maybe Pat disagrees or agrees, I think this is one of the biggest challenges for art historians and archaeologists working in this field. Um, is to explain how cultural exchange occurs. We know people, people, things, ideas moved, um, but why and how and what impact that movement had or that itinerancy had locally, um, the question is how do we measure that, right? Um, the last question perhaps uh, will remain unanswered uh, today, but it's part of a larger um, study on the inner workings of, for example, port cities uh, and of the mercantile communities that reside there. Um, looking at mercantile communities not just as carriers, but also as consumers. They're storytellers, they're people who move uh, in between different cultural uh, environments. <clears throat> 
So what I'm going to do today is just present a series of examples to set the stage um, for an examination of ancient trade and associated mercantile communities. And I'm going to move from the Bronze Age to the first millennium of the Common Era. Um, I'm going to be zeroing in on archaeological, textual, and artistic evidence for those exchanges. Um, and I just very briefly want to apologize to the society for somewhat messing up the rhythm of um, the calendar of talks. Um, since my work covers the early trade, the early periods, uh, I was initially invited to be the, deliver the first of the lectures in the Arts of Asia uh, series, but personal circumstances prevented me from being here, or that's at least what I thought, from being here early. Um, so I am actually following Pat, and there's quite a, 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 a chunk of time in between our two, two periods. So, before detailed accounts, uh, early trade routes are primarily known or primarily traced through raw materials and object sourcing. So, for example, in the Bronze Age, there's significant archaeological evidence for exchange networks that connected Central Asia to the Near East and China. When you think or look at the Indus, think about or look at the Indus Valley uh, civilization and the archaeology of the Indus Valley, in the Bronze Age, we know that they exported uh, lapis lazuli uh, to Egypt and other parts of the Near East via sea and over land. In fact, uh, Indus Valley had a sophisticated economic infrastructure. Um, they brought the raw materials from the northern site or the mining outpost of Shordugai in modern Afghanistan, transported it to the port cities uh, of Lothal and Sutka Gandor in India and Pakistan, respectively, to be shipped to the Near East and ultimately also including Egypt to be used in the decorative arts and statuary, as you can see from this uh, third millennium BCE statue. Uh, Egyptian statue and also this, this bowl that dates to the Bronze Age made out of lapis lazuli found in 3rd millennium BCE, Iran. In the opposite direction to China, we know that jade coming from the ancient, what became the ancient Khotanese kingdom in Xinjiang province and from Mongolia and turquoise from uh, ancient Afghanistan and Iran moved e west east to be used in decorative weaponry and statuary of Bronze Age cultures in China. So again, we can source raw materials, we can date them in the archaeological record, and we can then piece together the routes, the probable routes, by which these materials were carried from their place of origin to their place of production. So, although we have abundant uh, archaeological evidence to prove these very early distribution networks, it's not really clear how much interaction beyond raw materials transportation um, or raw materials import and export occurred. And merchants uh, and other carriers remain pretty much an unknown entity during these t this time. Even if we have a few epigraphic or uh, remains or inscriptions, they do not give detailed information on the mercantile communities. So all we can do is suggest that they were, there was some kind of economic interaction, which perhaps also had uh, resulted in, in cultural interaction as, as well. 
Now, when does that change? We start to get a little bit more information by the middle of the first millennium BCE. And this occurs with the political expansion, political and economic expansion of the so-called Achaemenid Persian Empire, when far-flung regions were brought together under single rule, and the infrastructure was put in place for resource extraction. At the famous site of Behistun, or Bisutun, in modern Iran, the Achaemenid king Darius I ordered the carving of a large relief and inscription describing the capture of his far-flung regions and his enemies. So this is the Bisutun. Relief and inscription um, in, it's a multilingual inscription, which is also very interesting. It's in Old Persian. Elamite and Babylonian, and it accounts for all the lands that came under Achaemenid control and whose subjects paid tribute to the Achaemenid kings, um, among which were a large number of uh, communities from Central Asia. So Persia, Elam, Babylonia, Assyria, Arabia, Egypt, the Greeks, Lydia, Parthia, Arya, and then in terms of Central Asia, you can uh, see included in the list Sogdia, Gandhara, and Bactria. If you look at the last line, seven, the king mentions these are the countries which are subject to me by the grace of Ahura Mazda. They became subject to me and they brought tribute to me. Much of that wealth, that tribute, that was extracted from all these different areas of the Achaemenid Empire uh, helped or, or, or grew the wealth that was used to build and embellish the centers of power during the Achaemenid period. Um, this is one example of uh, such a monument, uh, the large Achaemenid palace at, at Susa, uh, constructed with limestone columns and beautifully decorated with glazed tiles of archers and winged beings, as you can see here. Much of this material is, by the way, in the Louvre uh, in, in Paris. An inscription, a Sousa inscription, describes where all the goods and commodities came from that were used at the site um, to build up the capital. It also refers to many craftsmen and artisans who were hired, contracted, or forced uh, by the king to work on the palace. So it's an interesting list in terms of goods and commodities. So the inscription talks about cedar timber, which comes from Lebanon, yucca timber, which is a kind of reddish wood, was brought from Gandhara, among others. Gold was coming from Lydia and from Bactria. The precious stone lapis lazuli, carnelian, this was brought from Sogdia, and, and at this point the list is really talking about raw materials, right? Because the inscription uh, provides information that all these materials were then utilized in production sites in the center of the Achaemenid Empire. The silver and the ebony was brought from Egypt. The ornamentation uh, that came from the Greek world. The ivory came from Kush and from India and from Arachosha, which is Afghanistan. Um, and then the inscription goes on to, to talk, about, talk about the craftsmen. So it's interesting here, uh, you have now uh, written records or epigraphic references to the commodities that are moving from one area of this trading network or this network of exchanges to uh, another. Aside from Susa, there's another site uh, that dates to the Achaemenid period, perhaps the most important site uh, of that time. It was the large city and palace that was built by the Achaemenids at Persepolis. At Persepolis, there is an audience hall, a reception hall, 
uh, where the king received all the foreign envoys. And this reception hall on the outside, the staircase leading to it, is decorated by rows and rows of foreign delegations that are bringing the tribute that was just mentioned in the earlier inscription to the king. And visually, it's a very dramatic representation of royal reach, right? Here I am, the king, these are all my subjects, and they are all bringing these goods to me. So here are photographs of the, the, the reliefs that depict all these delegations. And these, this is an attempt in red to identify all the delegations. They're matched to the, del the, the subject territories mentioned in the inscriptions. And by looking perhaps at the dress and the goods that they're carrying, scholars have tried to match them. Um, now, there are a couple of delegations that are mentioned from Central Asia. So you have a Sogdian delegation. And Sogdiana was mentioned as a, a, a province of the Achaemenid Empire. And in the inscription of Susa, um, Sogdians were said to have carried lapis lazuli and carnelian to the Achaemenid king. And I give you some examples of how that raw material was then reworked into finished products. So the first one is this gold and lapis uh, right on that dates to the Achaemenid uh, period, which is in a museum today in, in Zurich. Um, and you can see uh, this beautiful you know, combination of using gold and this very precious raw material. Another example is the raw material carnelian that was then uh, reworked into you know, decorative uh, objects. Aside from the Sogdians who hailed from Central Asia, Bactrians are also depicted uh, on the Achaemenid reliefs, on the Apatana or audience hall reliefs at Persepolis. Uh, and they are recognized by uh, the camel, the Bactrian <laughs> camel. Um, I, you can't see his second hump on this uh, image, but there are definitely two. Uh, and you can see them, the delegation depicted carrying goods. Um, from Bactria, the Susa inscription mentioned, came turquoise, which was then used by Achaemenid period craftsmen in fine jewelry. Uh, there were also uh, references to direct imports from Bactria, and we know from archaeological evidence that Bactria, back to the Bronze Age, had uh, very fine goldsmiths or had a very fine gold production, gold object production industry. Um, and you can see an example of that uh, in this so-called Oxus treasure jar dating to the Achaemenid period, which was discovered in uh, Central Asia and is currently in the British Museum as part of the Oxus treasure hoard. Now, how do we know that these were, this was not just the king saying, look how powerful I am. These are all the people that are subject to me, and look, they honor me by bringing me tribute. Well, we have additional sources of information. We have Herodotus. Now, granted, uh, not everybody always agrees on whether or not Herodotus is a useful source because there's certainly parts of, of his histories that seem very far-fetched and almost mythological. But he does give us some interesting information about the Achaemenid infrastructure. And from Herodotus, we find out that uh, the Achaemenids put in place a road system to extract these resources and also to facilitate communication. So, and I quote from the English translation of Herodotus, now the true account of the road in question is the following. Royal, royal stations, and he refers to them as 
controlled by, by the states, exist along its whole length and excellent caravanserais, halting places, right, for the caravans that are moving through the region. They function pretty much like inns, hotels, you know, motels, probably, more appropriately. Um, and throughout, it traverses an inhabited tract and is free from danger. In Lydia and Phrygia, two regions uh, in, in the west, there are 20 stations within uh, a distance of 94 and a half parasangs. And one parasang, the modern equivalence, uh, Herodotus talks about a parasang being 30 stadia, which equals 3.5 miles, roughly. On leaving Phrygia, the Halys has to be crossed, and here are gates through which you must need to pass. Here you can traverse the stream. A strong force guards this post. When you have made the passage and come into Cappadocia, 28 stations and 104 parasangs brings you to the borders of Cilicia. It goes on for a while, and then at the end, you read, we read, thus the entire number of the station is raised to 111, and so many are in fact the resting places that one finds between Sardis and Susa. So we know that the Achaemenids built an infrastructure, protected that infrastructure, to connect different parts of their territories. Um, it probably was administratively important, in particular given the size of uh, the empire, but also in terms of building the wealth through these resources, either from Central Asia and from other areas. That infrastructure became very, very important. The Achaemenid expansion not only included the agricultural lands of Central Asia, but the steppe nomadic areas as well. And I think it's very important for us when we think about the Silk Road or Silk Road networks or networks of trade, that these did not just connect oases and the urban settlements, but they also stretched into the grasslands uh, of Central Asia or the grasslands of Eurasia. When we go back to the Bisutun inscription for a moment, uh, all the way at the back, and it's a very fine monument because you can see all the defeated leaders, right, from all these far-flung territories being brought in front of, uh, before the king, who is depicted on the left. Uh, they have their hands, their hands are tied behind the back, so they have been captured, right? Uh, they submit, they have submitted to the king. So the last, uh, individual has a pointed hat and he's the member or the leader of the Saka Scythian tribes that are located uh, in uh, the, the pastoral nomadic regions of Central Asia. The Saka delegation subsequently, and you can see the pointed hats there as well, is depicted then as bringing tribute from Saka lands to the king. And in the relief, and it's a bit hard to, to see due to the resolution, um, you can, I, I brought pictures, uh, actual uh, objects of the swords or the daggers that they're carrying and the jewelry that they're bringing to the king, the gold jewelry. The integration of the steppe world in a network of exchanges is evidenced by the, in the burials of the Eastern Scythic nomads discovered in the High Altai region at a site called Pazirik. And on this map, the shaded area just makes reference to these grasslands, these extended grasslands of Eurasia. Uh, that were inhabited by uh, a number of very, very diverse pastoral nomadic groups that made their living through herding and in this instance, of course, through this exchange network with, uh, in this example, uh, the sedentary empires of the south. So Pasarik is a very interesting site uh, dated somewhere between the 5th and 3rd century BCE. 
Pasirik is not an ancient name. It's uh, the, the culture is really named after the village where the first burials, pastoral nomadic burials, were uncovered. And the evidence for the steppe in this period is really through burials because pastoral nomads move, they're migratory, they don't have settlements, they don't build houses. So the only way we find them or we can document them is through their burials. And the burials are referred to as Kurgan burials. And you can see on the top right uh, a photograph published in uh, one of the issues of National Geographic magazine. Uh, their uh, shaft burials, in other words, a three meter to five meter shaft is dug into the ground in which a burial chamber is built. And then once the burial chamber is filled and closed on top of the earth, a huge circular mound of stone is built. And you can see uh, some of those stones in that, in that photograph. Now, Pazirik is very important because the site is located in the high Altai region, a region that, where it gets very, very cold. And so a lot of the materials that were in or discovered uh, in these um, Kurgan sites had been protected by the permafrost conditions. In other words, they were frozen. They're often referred to as the frozen tombs of the Altai. Now, what's interesting about Pasirik? A number of these burials Uh, revealed goods that were coming from other places, from more sedentary areas. And in this, you know, to, to go further east in this, in this story, there were three very particular um, finds. A chariot, a bronze mirror, and a silk hanging, uh, which was used actually as a shabrak or a, a, a saddle cloth which makes perfect sense because you're talking about a, a pastoral nomadic uh, group. Uh, these three objects came from China and were brought through regular exchanges or through some kind of perhaps tribute exchanges. Another very beautiful object found at Pazirik uh, is the so-called Pazirik pile carpet. It's knotted. And it originates from the periphery of the Achaemenid Empire, dating somewhere in the, to the 5th century BCE. Uh, it's currently at the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. And if you look at the design of that carpet, and again, we know that this is not a locally produced carpet because you don't find pile carpet production in the steppe areas. These came from, Lu from, from industries. Uh, more associated with a sedentary uh, world. So when you look at some of the uh, designs on the carpet, so there's a whole row of marching horse riders on the, one of the outer bands of the carpet. It's very similar to the rows that you find on the Persepolis reliefs of horse riders. The design of fallow deer, and I gave you an actual picture of a fallow deer. Uh, at that time, uh, they were found in West Asia, sort of in the Near East. They're not typical of the steppe. You don't find them in the steppe areas. And then you have a lotus palmet uh, design. So obviously, the nomads, even as far as high up as the, the Altai, southern Siberia, Mongolia, were in contact with the southern territories in the first millennium BC, both uh, in West Asia, but also in East Asia. In addition to objects that came from elsewhere, Pazirik also presents other cross-cultural features. Now, it's important to understand that some of the objects that were imported or came from outside into Pazirik had to fit the lifestyle of the pastoral 
nomads. So there are a number of instances where you have woven cloth that is coming from elsewhere, and you can see the Achaemenid woven textile, and I give you the example of uh, Susa, the Susa tile decoration to see how analogous the, 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 the representations are. They were cut up and re-sewn into textiles that would be conducive to the pastoral nomadic riding environment. So they were used as saddle cloths rather than as perhaps hangings or, you know, uh, carpets that you would put on, on the floor. So there are two examples of that. And then in other instances, what's very intriguing is that some of the imagery that obviously was coming from the outside was incorporated into local felt designs. So the Achaemenids, for example, you, this cloak pin made of gold, there are a lot of objects that depict these feline animal heads. And all of a sudden you start to see those designs in locally produced work on the step. So you have this kind of, you know, cross-fertilization uh, occurring. One more example, I guess, of the, of the uh, first millennium BCE that I want to talk about that all directly lead to sort of these, these cross-cultural exchanges is the interaction between the ancient Greeks and the pastoral nomadic step, in particular the Scythians or the Sakas of the Black Sea region. Now, in ancient Greece, when you have this expansion, which starts in the 8th century BCE, you see that in the Black Sea region by the 5th century BCE, you have trading colonies that are being established by the Greeks. They're referred to uh, directly as emporia, right? They are there for trading purposes. Um, and this is a region that is on the fringes of the pastoral nomadic steppes. Now here it's very interesting to note that the first references to female horse riding warriors popularly known in Greek mythology as the Amazons, stem from this period. Now, in Greek writing, they are um, configured in a very peculiar way. They're described as man-hating, disfigured, and kind of liminal figures right, of the then known world. Uh, Greek literature really eroticizes and exoticizes them. And their primary function seems to have been to be tamed by Greek heroes, right? You can think of uh, the 12 labors of Heracles, right? What, what is one of their, the labors? He has to go to Amazonian territory and capture the girdle, no less the girdle, <laughs> of the Amazonian queen and bring it back. And if he survives that, he can go move on to the next labor, right? And you can, you, there's stories about Achilles, there's stories about other Greek heroes whose primary task is to defeat and to tame those female um, kind of other, right, females of the fringes of the Greek world. Now, What's interesting is that ancient Greek sculpture and vase painting tradition uh, vividly begin to depict those encounters. So here you have an example of an Amazon being defeated on a, right, by two Greek warriors. And this, the Amazon frees from the ma mausoleum at Halicarnassus. Uh, which is in Bodrum, Turkey, from the 4th century BCE. You can see a Greek hero battling a woman on, on horseback. Um, one interesting tidbit, uh, I mean, I talk to my students all the time. You know, I said, okay, I, I, I say Amazon, what say you? And it's still very <laughs> vivid, that image of this kind of wild woman that 
you know, men really need to tame because otherwise society is going to hell. So here the famous films, right, of the 1950s and 60s, Hell Had No Fury Like 10,000 Women on Horseback, began very early, right, in the first millennium BCE. Now, in the past, uh, a lot of scholars dismissed the myths as inventions by which the Greeks positioned themselves as the superior norm, right? We're the superior society, everybody else has strange behaviors around us, right? And that helps define uh, our, our position. So, dismissed as a kind of figment of the imagination of the ancient Greeks. But what we're finding now, archaeologically, a lot of evidence for women who fought on horseback uh, on the steppe. I give you one example. Very near to the Black Sea, Rostov on Don, of a number of graves, single female graves, with women that were buried with many arrowheads that showed signs of leading a life on horseback with arrows embedded in their skeletal remains. So we knew, no, or we can deduce from that, that they were actively engaged in battles, right? So it is conceivable that these encounters actually were very real. Um, so I would see the Amazonian myth as, as based on real encounters, but kind of proof that the Greek patriarchal psyche uh, that held the level of female de domestication uh, as the true marker of ideal society might not have been fully able to process <laughs> what they were seeing and really reconfigured right, uh, the idea of a horse riding woman into something that was very different, odd. Um, right? So, uh, as an example uh, of, you know, the, the, these trading networks that, that are moving commodities, goods, that are extracting resources, also lead to these very personal encounters. And these personal encounters lead to stories and a uh, body of literature that is brought back and widely distributed within ancient Greek society. So, the early period. We have archaeological evidence uh, that is quite unequivocal in support of cultural interaction. Despite that fact, it is still unclear how regular these contacts in the first millennium BC were, BCE were and whether they went beyond sporadic encounters or diplomatic gift giving, resource ex extraction, um, and that they constituted actual wide scale trading. Uh, activities. We really don't know that. The material in Pasarik could have been a diplomatic gift, right, from ancient China. Uh, in the context of appeasement policies, right, between pastoral nomads to the north of the, the great uh, empires. Regular mercantile activity, long distance mercantile activity and knowledge of far-flung regions becomes more apparent in the textual sources of the Roman Empire and the Han Dynasty, in particular around the turn of the Common Era, uh, when this network of overland and sea routes that are today popularized as the Silk Roads were established to move goods right, from one end the Mediterranean to uh, India and then beyond. Now, again, understanding these early, I, I have to admit, I'm always jealous of people who work in the later periods <laughs> because starting in the Tang, the Tang period in China, for example, you have so much more documentation <laughs> on mercantile communities than you have in the early period where we're working with tiny pieces Right, of a very, very large puzzle. So understanding these commercial networks is not an easy task. 
uh, again, we can piece together starting points, we can piece together endpoints, but it's actually very difficult to figure out exact routes unless they are indicated or written about in textual uh, sources. Now, best we can gauge from those sources is that there were multiple routes that were used um, by different trading communities at different times. Uh, so you don't have a nice little neat Silk Road network that you can just identify and say, merchants went from this point to that point and this is how they traveled. The fancy maps that you see, right, when you Google Silk Roads, <laughs> Yeah, they're too neat. <laughs> we really don't know the exact ways by which people traveled. Now, textual sources of both the Roman Empire and also the Chinese Han Dynasty um, suggest knowledge of both sea and land routes. However, actual traveling back and forth between the two political entities rarely happened during this period. Now, before I go into the maritime routes and um, um, talk about the, the Han Dynasty and the Roman Empire, it's important to qualify what we mean when we say, when we use the term Roman Empire, right? It's not a monolith. What we're really talking about is an entity that included uh, very, very diverse territories. It was multilingual, it was multi-ethnic. And so when Roman sources talk about merchants, we again know very little about them, about who they were, right? Did they come from Syria? Were they Nabataeans? Were they Egyptians, right? Were they Europeans? Germanic. We don't have, always have that information. So we use the term Roman Empire, but it's really not uh, appropriate. Um, we do know from sporadic textual sources that merchants were active. Some of them are mentioned by name, but very few. So for example, in the S Claudius Ptolemy, it's a source of the second century CE, there's a reference to a certain merchants who, merchant who has embarked on a trading mission towards China, uh, towards uh, the area of the Ceres, or the people who produce silk, possibly aiming for the end of, you know, in terms of eastern direction, uh, the start of the Ganzu uh, corridor. And this is not a diplomatic trip. This is a trip to secure a trading deal with counterparts in China. So we know that that did occur, but we have very, very few references uh, that allow us to paint a very clear picture of uh, the mercantile society. Even though we like uh, everything to be equal in the ancient world, it is very clear that the Romans were the most active in this period. There was Chinese trade, but the Romans were most likely to cross boundaries. Right. So, Romans established a network, um, not just you know, connecting the far-flung territories of the Roman Empire, but well beyond in the ports of the east coast of Africa and the west coast of India. And they were involved in direct trade in those foreign territories. And this becomes important uh, when we start in the second half talk about this, this the, 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 the mercantile uh, diasporic mercantile communities as, as vectors for cultural transmission because these were uh, trading communities that actually resided in these various places far away from the Roman Empire. Um, aside from this, the few accounts that 
reference individual traders, one of the most valuable source, I think, uh, for reconstructing maritime trade is the so-called Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. It's a manuscript that, that is dated to the first century CE. It is written in Greek, and it was written by a merchant residing in Roman Egypt. We don't know whether he was Greek, Egyptian, but he wrote in Greek, and he mentions that Egypt is the starting point for maritime trade during the Roman period. Um, the Periplus deals with two routes, one north-south from Alexandria, Egypt, through the Red Sea, I'll have a better map in a minute, uh, to the east coast of Africa, and then a route east-west that comes through the Red Sea and goes across the Indian Ocean to various parts of the Indian Ocean, literal, all the way to the west coast of India. This map, which you can find, by the way, uh, it's useful, you can find it on Wikipedia, um, lists all the port cities of the first century CE uh, that you find in this Roman network of maritime trade. So starting the mouth of the, the Mediterranean, of Alexandria, you go down, you see the ports of the Red Sea, then if you take the north-south road uh, route, you will see the ports of the east coast of, of Africa. And that mosaic that I just showed you of a, a Roman ship hauling an elephant, an African elephant, onto it to be transported back, those were the docks for that type of, of trade. And you can see that the map stretches all the way to the west coast of India, where there are a number of ports that were utilized by Roman trade, Roman merchants. Now, the further you go from the west coast of India, for example, to Sri Lanka, and even the east coast of southern India, the Periplus gets very vague, which seems to indicate that the west coast was the terminus for Roman merchants, and that southern Indian um, mercantile communities dealt with the trade to Sri Lanka and also to the East Coast or, or to Southeast Asia and I'll mention the evidence for that in a minute. Now one of the ports on the west coast of India is a port called Muziris in the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Now, one very interesting thing about the Periplus, it has some references to the merchants, but it's primarily documentation of export and import. So in other words, it provided information for traders on where to get stuff and where to offload stuff. So it's divided up into each port city, what you can export, what it exports, and what they are bringing in, what they want in those cities. So just as an example, Muziris, uh, black pepper seems to have been the most dominant product that the Romans wanted out of that maritime trade from southern India. In addition, there was nard, ivory, pearl, cinnamon, tortoise shell, which actually came from Sri Lanka, but was traded to the Romans in South India because the Romans didn't go to Sri Lanka directly in this time. In the list of expo uh, exports, you see imported cloves. And this is very interesting because cloves at that time came from Southeast Asia. The Malaccas and in Indonesia, that was the source for cloves for a very, very long time, well into uh, the Tang period. So southern Indian merchants, Sri Lankan merchants, must have had some kind of networks right, going east to Southeast Asia that was bringing, or vice versa, Southeast Asian merchants, bringing the cloves where they then would be bought up by Roman merchants. <laughs> 
Uh, in terms of imports, gold Roman coins, this is very interesting because it appears that, in particular in the trade for black pe the, the acquisition of black pepper, Romans had a tendency to pay cash. So there are significant coin hoards, uh, Roman coin hoards that have been uncovered in India, kind of uh, providing the evidence for, for those kinds of uh, exchanges. There is one very interesting manuscripts, uh, and it's interesting or it's important because it documents the size of the consignments. And there's a lot of back and forth in the archaeological, the academic archaeological world about how much trade really played a part and do we have actual real evidence for regular activities and lots of merchandise moving. Well, looking at this but Museris papyrus, which is actually was discovered in the 1980s, it's currently in, in uh, the Austrian National Archive in Vienna, it's written in Greek, um, and it documents the goods for export from Musiris uh, to Alexandria, Egypt, directly from Musiris to Alexandria, aboard the ship Hermopolon. And this passage is taken from, from Ball, Warwick Ball's work, Rome in the East, and I quote, this consignment consisted of 700 to 1,700 pounds of nard, 4,700 uh, pounds of ivory, and almost 790 pounds of textiles. This has been calculated as worth the total value of 131 talents, enough to purchase 2,400 acres of the best farmland in Egypt. When it's borne in mind that an average Roman cargo ship would have held about 150 such consignments, you can imagine that that papyrus, and this papyrus is a contract. It's a contract between the financier and the merchants, and the merchants. So the one side of the, the papyrus, the papyrus, uh, details a contract for a loan from a rich ship owner to the merchants. Now you take this money, you go to Muziris, and this is what I want you to buy and bring back from Musiris to Alexandria. So on the one side you have the contract, which is signed by the two, two parties, and on the other side you have the details of the, of the consignment. So I think, you know, obviously it, it's hard to find, always find direct archaeological evidence, but there is some textual uh, support for the intensity of Roman trade at this, at this moment. Uh, in addition to the sheer quantity uh, of goods as listed in uh, the Moziris Papyrus, the frequency of trade is suggested by other authors. So for example, Strabo in the late first century BCE, early first century CE, uh, notes that 120 ships sailed from Mios Hormos to India. Now, Mios Hormos is a, is a port on the Red Sea. I'll show you a map in a minute. So that passage reads, at any rate, when Gallus was prefect of Egypt, I accompanied him and ascended the Nile as far as Syene and the frontiers of Ethiopia. And I learned that as many as 120 vessels were sailing from Mios Hormos to India, whereas formerly under the Ptolemies, only a very few ventured to undertake the voyage and to carry on traffic in Indian merchandise. So the textual sources of this period start to document an increase in trading activities to uh, the east. I'm going to stop as soon as I show you the pictures of Mios Hormos. Uh, so this is the port of Mios Hormos. There's a little drawing of the, of the um, in, inlet, the sea inlet where the harbor was built and some of the archaeological evidence, including thousands of amphorae that were carrying, you know, being carried through the various port cities and ended up in cities like Muziris with uh, wine, containing wine and uh, olive oil. <laughs> 
I have to stop for a short break. So I'll pick up the China component in this story right after the break.